for having me along today. My name is Mike Ferguson. As, uh, as I was introduced, one of the directors at Skyscanner. <coughs> I have a particular focus on working within destinations with our, our DMO partners, also look after our hotel business and our car hire business. Today I'm going to talk to you about a few of the insights that we see through the interactions of our travellers on Skyscanner. A lot of it will resonate with a few of the points that have been raised already today, so we'll just, uh, we'll just kick off. Um, so yeah, four sections I'm going to take you through today. I'll give you a little bit of an introduction to Skyscanner in terms of who we are in case you don't know, and a little bit about our journey so far. I'll talk to you um, a little bit about some global traveller insights that we've seen both pre-pandemic and how that looks as we emerge out of the pandemic. We'll then dive into some specific Edinburgh um, data points, which hopefully you'll find interesting. And then I'll conclude with a, a bit of a summary of a case study from a recent campaign we did with Visit Scotland. Okay, so about Skyscanner. Um, we're a global travel marketplace with local expertise. What, what does that mean? It means we operate globally. We're um, available in 52 markets in over 30 languages. We have offices in um, uh, Shenzhen, Singapore, Barcelona, Glasgow, Edinburgh, London, and Miami. We were founded here in Edinburgh in 2003. We're still very much an Edinburgh-centric business. We have, um, I think it's still our biggest office. London is maybe close, but Edinburgh, I'm pretty sure, is still our biggest office in terms of headcount, up at quarter mile. Um, and we have been uh, named the, the, the best flight comparison website by which on a number of occasions. Our mission really is quite simple, and it is to simplify the, 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 the complexity that comes with air travel. Um, and we try and focus heavily on trust to make sure that our travelers can find trusted ways of, of traveling to and from their chosen destinations. So, in terms of scale, um, we currently have 94 million active monthly users. Uh, Pre-pandemic, that was over 100 million. If I was giving this presentation to you in perhaps two weeks' time, I might be able to say it's more than 94 million, but officially I can't. It is only 94 million as of today, but watch this space. I like this slide. It just sort of tells us a little bit about the journey Skyscanner's been on. I won't necessarily pick out every single date um, timestamp on here, but I'll talk to you about a few of them. So, in 2003, Three software engineer friends decided that they were having problems piecing together their own itinerary um, when it came to uh, planning their ski trips. I believe that the first version of Skyscanner was written on the back of a beer mat. Don't know whether it's true, but as an anecdote, I like it, so we're going to stick with it. Um, in 2006, so Skyscanner was launched in 2003. That makes us 20 years old this year. In 2006, we launched a feature called Search Everywhere, which, as the name suggests, it's for people who have chosen to travel, but they don't know where they want to go. Still our most popular feature, and we'll come back to that point a couple of times later on in the presentation. As I mentioned earlier, it's 30 languages, but if I fast forward here, next point I'll pick out is 2013, 2014. We launched car hire and hotels. So Skyscanner is most famous for its flights, but it is um, operating in a number of different verticals. In 2016, we were acquired by Ctrip, now known as Trip.com, which is a, a, a large Chinese OTA. Uh, we still maintain operational independence. We're still very much our own, our own entity, but we have uh, a large owner. That deal was $1.4 billion. <clears throat> I mentioned the which accolade. If we skip to 2019, we hit a record number of unique visitors a month at 100 million. There was a couple of references to 2019 before when people talked about the strategy and, and taking a pause and revisiting things. We did exactly that. We got the entire organization, the first time we've ever done it, together in London for a sort of company summit and we planned about what the next stage of our iteration was going to be, and then COVID hit, and nobody travelled. So it was kind of a, quite a momentous, a momentous time. Um, but you know, during 2020, or from, from 2019, from the pandemic on, we had to pivot because we're a flight-centric business, and nobody was flying. Almost nobody was flying anywhere in the world. So we had to think about what we were going to do, and we, we, we changed our focus to, to become a bit more utilitarian in terms of up the funnel, not so much booking, but what we did was we launched one of the, big, the best features we launched was the COVID map, which, as the name suggests, was a map that told you where you could travel to and from, what the restrictions might be and what the travel considerations were. So that was a hugely impactful tool that we launched during the, the, the pandemic. Fast forward to today and, and, and sort of end of 2022 and into 2023, we're now back to pretty much pre-pandemic levels. Official figures, 94 million uh, unique visitors a month. So that's been the Skyscanner journey. Uh, I'll talk to you a little bit about some global traveller insights now. Um, this is from our search and demand data. So the search data is, as the name suggests, people search on Skyscanner, origin, destination, and date range, and demand data is where they're clicking, what they're actually looking to buy into. 
so it's a combination of our own on-site uh, data and uh, a survey from 11,000 travelers across 10 markets. So probably reassuring to everybody in this room, travel is being prioritized in 2023. 82% uh, of travellers globally are planning to take more or at least the same number of trips abroad as they did in 2022. That's the, actual, that's the propensity to travel. If you look at the spend, 41% are planning to spend more in travel. And that is despite the, 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 the rising cost of, um, the, the, the cost of living crisis and various other uh, political and economic pressures that exist. Next slide. Um, Specifically within the UK, 70% of UK travellers plan to spend the same, if not more, on travel abroad in 2023. So that's slightly less than the 82% on this slide, but 70% is still a pretty encouraging figure. And sustainability has been touched on a couple of times already. 28% of our respondents said that travel-related sustainability is more important to them now uh, than it was pre-pandemic. And that is a, a trend that we see going in one direction only. Workations. It's a new word. Um, it's probably more fun than it sounds. A workation is effectively people are choosing to spend, to blend holidays and working time. Uh, there's a lot, of, um, a lot of talk about digital nomads and so on. It, what this really is, is perhaps think of, you know, instead of taking your typical two week holiday, you're gonna take a three week trip abroad and you're gonna work for a week of that time while you're away. It's maybe not for me, but one in six people are considering taking a workation this year. Another trend that we see is 29% are, are considering escaping solo. I suspect that's not two weeks in a resort hotel, but it's, you know, th there, is a, there is an increasing uh, propensity for people to travel alone. And of, those, of that 29%, around 50% of those have cited the reason that they have differing interests from their friends and family. You can't choose your family, but you can choose your friends, so they might want to have a think about that. Um, this slide here, is, there's quite a lot here to take in, so I'll maybe pause on it for a second and I'll call out a few of the key data points. This is propensity to travel in 2023. The dark blue line is more, the small blue line, the small next dark line is, is less, then it's the same, and I don't know yet is the last one. So there's a couple of things to call out here. <coughs> Excuse me, 82% of travelers globally are gonna take at least the same number of trips as they did in 2023. Nearly half are gonna take more, and only 7% are planning on taking less. 12% are undecided. And if you look at Australia, that's 16%, 17% in Canada, 20% in the UK. So the opportunity here for travel organizations, travel businesses, is to focus in on that undecided um, proportion because th th there's an opportunity to convert there. China, been mentioned a few times already. Uh, you might have noticed on this slide, there is no mention of any Asian markets. And that's simply because the Asian markets, China being the most extremely impacted, um, typically had, uh, had, had um, longer restrictions, longer um, impact on their ability to travel, and they're only now coming out of it fully. So China, if we look back to this slide, um, we don't have data on it as it stands, but Oxford Economics are very, very confident that H2 2023, this year, is going to see the mass return of Chinese international travel. If it's not then, it looks like it's going to be H2. Certainly from what we're seeing and hearing, and bearing in mind we have a Chinese um, travel business that owns us, uh, H2 2023 is looking extremely optimistic for the return of Chinese travel. This is looking at travel spend. <clears throat> um, so I've touched on this already. There's a couple of key points here. Uh, travel spend is going to be prioritized. 77% are going to spend more in 2023. Uh, sorry, the same or more, and 41% are going to spend more. Again, the UAE and Saudi Arabia, there's huge, huge um, uh, plans to spend from those markets, um, with over half of travelers in the UAE and Saudi spending more compared to, on average, across the European markets, it seems to be around the 30% um, uh, uh, limit there. 40% of Canadians and 43% of Americans are gonna be spending more this year compared to previous years. Spending preferences. So whilst what I've talked about so far has been materially positive and everything looks great, there are some, uh, some words of caution around the, the, how people are gonna spend. Across the, the top line, 36% of people are gonna pick a destination where the money goes further. Um, so exchange rates are a key consideration for travelers. 32% will not spend as much on hotels and 32% won't spend as much in destination. That varies quite a lot market by market. 
Um, again, you'll see the USA is particularly price sensitive based on the data we've collected. And then maybe if you look at the Netherlands and Germany as, as, as the other extreme. But so whilst there is a, a huge, huge pent up demand for travel, um, and overall things are looking extremely optimistic, a couple of words of caution just in terms of how people are going to spend. However, without too much doom and gloom, this graph shows the last sort of 12 weeks, more or less. Um, starts off end of October, I think it's actually 24th of October, where, where it starts off. You'll see a typical seasonal decline in terms of international travel demand as you go into the, into the Christmas period. The very bottom of that graph is Christmas Day, almost certainly. Um, and then what you see immediately after Christmas Day is a huge up into the right shift in that, in that travel demand, and it, demand really is rocketing. Um, and as I say, you know, we're super confident that travel demand in 2023 will exceed what it was in 2019. Some specifics around Edinburgh. Um, some of this may be surprising, some of it may not be. 88% of travellers tend to stay in Edinburgh for a week or less. For me, that makes perfect sense. Um, Edinburgh probably sits squarely in the sort of city break category, so to spend a week or less in Edinburgh sounds, sounds reasonable to me. However, this was a surprising to me. Now, bear in mind, this is based on, the data we have is based on international travel into Edinburgh. Uh, so it doesn't, it doesn't factor in those that are traveling domestically or who are uh, using ground transportation to come up from, from anywhere else in, in the UK. The dark blue line here shows the month that people are searching for Edinburgh as a destination. So September and October is when we see on Skyscanner the highest volume of people looking at Edinburgh as a destination. It's not the month of travel, it's simply the month that they're sitting at their laptop or on their phone looking at Edinburgh as a destination. When it comes to the actual month of travel, we see November and December as the peak months. Um, I can't possibly explain that to you, but the data doesn't lie. Um, that's, that's what we see on Skyscanner. In terms of um, top flights for, uh, for, for Edinburgh, this is coming into Edinburgh again, keeping in mind this doesn't include ground transportation, nor does it include um, people flying into London or other UK airports, but directly into Edinburgh, Germany, France, Spain, Italy, and Ireland are the top five destinations for inbound tourism. Um, probably, probably no surprise there. Where Edinburgh residents are searching uh, to go to, again, doesn't take into consideration people leaving from other, other areas or other parts of the UK, but Spain, France, Italy are in the top three. The United States is in the, sorry, the, United States is in the top five as well. And Explore Everywhere, which is that piece of functionality that we launched back in 2006, which is still our most, um, our most uh, in-demand piece of functionality, that's in the top five. It's probably in the top five, doesn't matter what market you look at, Explore Everywhere is, is, um, is, is always in the, uh, in the top. Um, case study. Just share this, we've got probably three or four more slides, um, so it looks like I'm going to get you some time back. Um, case study we did with Visit Scotland. Now, we, part of my role is working with our destination partners ac across, the, across the globe. We've done a couple of campaigns with Visit Scotland. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Yeah, so we, we obviously well, during the pandemic, there was a lot of very, very reactive rules. Things were changing very, very quickly. Spain was open one day, it was closed the next. Uh, so when the rules relaxed back in March 2022, we launched a campaign with Visit Scotland, and it was to target Western European markets. The three markets that we, um, that we agreed to work with them on was Germany, France, and the Netherlands. And the message was pretty simple. It was focusing on the magnificent cities that exist in Scotland and the magnificent countryside, and that it was open to be explored again. So we... Uh, We did that, here's a couple of visuals of, um, of how the campaign looked on Skyscanner. Um, we communicated with them at different stages of the journey because when you're on Skyscanner, you might be dreaming, you might be planning, you might actually be booking. All stages of that sort of planning and booking cycle exist on Skyscanner. So we, we targeted them in native languages, obviously, as I mentioned earlier on, we're in multiple languages. Um, we focused on Edinburgh and Glasgow imagery, a strong on, on, on the search results. And we also focused on the search everywhere functionality. But again, using the data that we have in Skyscanner, we have, a, we have the um, visibility of where other people are searching. So people who are searching for Glasgow or Edinburgh may also be looking for Reykjavik or Paris or Madrid. We, it could be any number of places, but we can identify where Edinburgh is in competition with. And therefore, we served the Visit Scotland campaign to those who were considering destinations that weren't Edinburgh, that were you know, in the same session. 
Um, <clears throat> the emotive line that we used was Scotland is calling. It was a huge success in terms of a campaign. Uh, if Lauren Hogg's here, hopefully you can validate this is exactly what you said. Um, if it's not, you'll have to take my word for it. But the team were fantastic to work with, went the extra mile to ensure our campaign performed as well as possible, and it was also fitting to work with an Edinburgh institution like Skyscanner. We had a strong Scottish bond. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, I mean, the, the campaign that we, 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 we ran with Visit Scotland, we mapped out the different areas of the user journey, we ensured we delivered the campaign, the appropriate messaging at different stages of the, of the user journey, and we tailored it at various different points. Ultimately, what we, what we did in conjunction with Visit Scotland was we adjusted the pacing of the campaign so that it delivered over a longer period of time than originally planned to make sure that we got the conversions that we had anticipated. In terms of results, that campaign reached two and a half million travelers. Bearing in mind, this is immediately after the, after the restrictions were lifted. Huge pent up demand, huge competition. So we managed to put this campaign in front of two and a half million travelers with a, an interest in, 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 in Scotland. It was a 1,114% return on their ad spend and a bookings growth of 1,257. So overall, a fantastic campaign um, and uh, great to work with Visit Scotland. I think that's me. I have um, really only just scratched the surface in terms of the data and the insights that we have available at Skyscanner. Hopefully some of that was interesting. If you'd like to know more or, or, or you know, dig a little bit deeper in terms of any of the data points that I've covered today, then please let me know. My email address is not intentionally super small so that you can't read it. Um, I, will, I, will, I will read it out in case you are interested. It's mike.ferguson at skyscanner.net. Please do get in touch. Thank you once again for having me today and enjoy the rest of the uh, conference.